The Advocates is made possible by grants from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and Merrill Lynch Pierce Fenner and Smith Incorporated. If you're a regular viewer, you know that there aren't any commercials here on Channel 2. No one here, is, no one here will ever try to sell you anything other than the very best in programming. But that means we don't have any revenue from advertising, and that's why we have to turn to you, our viewer, and ask for your support for 80% of our operating budget. And let's face it, operating this television station is a very expensive business. Because we need you. We need your subscription. Make a pledge of $5, make a pledge of 20 make a pledge of 50 $50 will bring you a lot of things, as you well know. It'll bring you uh, an umbrella. Whatever you pledge tonight can be paid for on the installment plan. You can use your credit card, master charge, or visa, or you can give a check or money order. So we want you to do your part. If you haven't done it, now is the time. There are a couple more minutes before we go back to the PBS special. <laughs> For $35 family membership, we have a special premium offer during festival, and here it is. This go anywhere, do anything pitcher and cup set is a real family pleaser at the door on the table. Made of hey, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hey, fellas, listen, I think you do a terrific job. I'm wild about a lot of your programs, but if you're going to keep on asking me for my money like this, you might as well have commercials. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to The Advocates. I'm Michael Dukakis. We're debating an unusual subject tonight, but it's one that should be of special interest to all of you who are watching us because you're watching public television and many of you listen to public radio. The funding of our non-commercial stations in this country has always been a problem. In the early years, a few viewers and the Ford Foundation in particular contributed to keep the stations going. Educational funds from the federal government helped to buy, as they still do, some of the equipment, but there was no public broadcasting network. The first report of the Carnegie Commission on Public Broadcasting in 1967 recommended that the stations be tied into a national system to be called the Public Broadcasting Service. The Carnegie Commission report also recommended that a central corporation for public broadcasting be established to distribute funds to the stations which produce programs and that major federal funding be provided for public broadcasting. The system was established, but only recently did federal support reached the $100 million recommended way back there in 1967. In February of this year, the second Carnegie Commission report was issued. It recommended some changes in the management structure of public broadcasting to save some administrative dollars, but it also asked for substantially increased federal funding for public broadcasting, some $590 million a year, or four and a half times the present level of federal support. And just a few days ago, the House Subcommittee on Communications, chaired by Representative Lionel Van Dierlen of California, came up with its own proposal. It would also provide substantially increased federal funds for programming. The committee recommended a new national program endowment, which would replace the present Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and that endowment would distribute money, but could also produce programs for the system, something which is not possible under the present system. Tonight, we're going to be debating the central principles common to these proposals that federal funds should make up a substantial proportion up to half of the total budget for public broadcasting and the programming decisions be more centralized. Should Congress substantially increase federal funding for public broadcasting? Advocate Roger Fisher says yes. <clears throat> public broadcasting is today's town hall. It needs substantially more funds. Our witnesses tonight are two experts in the field, television critic for the Boston Globe, William A. Henry III, and a man who served with both Carnegie Commissions on Public Broadcasting, Eli Evans, president of the Redison Foundation. Our case this evening is simple and direct. As our society grows bigger and more complex, we can no longer exchange our ideas in the village green or in the town hall. <clears throat> Concerns of the elderly, the ethnic groups, the minorities tend to get lost in the shuffle. Commercial broadcasting can provide mass entertainment. It can serve some of our communication uh, needs, but it means most of them unmet, large numbers of them unmet. The profit motive in free enterprise helps a lot, but it can't solve all our problems. Uh, profits do not build public schools, public libraries, public museums, state universities, 
art galleries and things of that kind. <clears throat> Without federal funds, public broadcasting will be over. It'll be dead. It'll take an increase in federal funds to provide to make it fulfill its needs. Diversity of funding sources will assure the kind of balance and independence that we need. If we each year we can pay some $75 for federal aid to schools, we can pay two dollars and a half per person for federal aid to federal broadcasting, to public broadcasting. That's what we're talking about. Our children spend more time in television than they do in school. What we're talking about is two bucks and a half per person in this country for public broadcasting. We can afford it. Thank you. Advocate William Rusher says no. There can't be many assignments less inviting at first glance than trying to persuade an audience composed entirely of people who watch television on the public broadcasting system that the federal government should not give more money to PBS. And yet, if you will just think about it a minute, I believe you will agree with these men who say it shouldn't. Mr. William Purvuge, Vice Chairman of Boston Broadcasters Incorporated and a lecturer at Harvard Business School, and Mr. M. Stanton Evans, nationally syndicated columnist and commentator for CBS Radio. I think you will agree because you are... After all, by and large, the same people who voted for the scores of propositions and initiatives and amendments all over the country this past year to limit the expenditures of government and reduce the tax burden on everyone. You have certainly seen in recent years the steady invasion by big government of more and more areas of our lives, always accompanied by large amounts of cash, your cash. Tonight, once again, the advocate deals with a proposal for more government spending. The only difference is that this time, the money will be spent, or so we are led to believe, on television programs that you and I like. My hope of prevailing this evening depends, therefore, on appealing to your sense of social responsibility. Do you really want people a great deal poorer than yourself to be taxed to furnish you and me with the kind of supposedly high-level entertainment we prefer Luckily, the days when only tax money could provide decent television are fast drawing to a close. We're on the threshold of new technological advances, such as video cassettes and cable TV, which will make opera and Shakespeare and even the advocates available to everyone who wants them without costing America's taxpayers a nickel. So wait to hear our side. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll be back to your cases in our debate in a moment, but first a word about tonight's debate, an additional word. One of the more interesting proposals of the Van Dierland subcommittee was one that would allow public television stations to run commercial advertising to raise money. Under the proposal, the ads wouldn't be allowed to interrupt programs. They would have been or would be limited to 3% of airtime in three restricted blocks a day, and that compares with 12 to 30% of a commercial station's airtime, which is now devoted to commercial messages. I want to emphasize, however, that our witnesses have varying opinions on that subject, and it will not be a part of tonight's debate. Now let's get on with our discussion and our debate. Mr. Fisher, the floor is yours. Thank you. I call as my first witness one of America's best-read critics of this area, someone who really watches television, as many of us may not as much as others, uh, William A. Henry III. Mr. Henry? Welcome to The Advocates, Mr. Henry. Nice to have you with us. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> You've just heard Mr. Rusher say that this is a special program for the elite. Who watches public television, Mr. Henry? The short answer is everybody. There's a rumor out there to the effect that public television's audience is an elite, a, a tiny few. In fact, 60% of the country finds a reason to tune in every single month, and the median viewer of public television has a household income of $15,000 or less and a high school education or less. It seems to me that's Joe Average. Is that significantly different from commercial television? The public television audience is perhaps marginally more affluent, marginally more educated, but both audiences pretty much match up with the national statistical norm. The, the short version is everybody watches television, both public and commercial, and the people who watch the most public television also turn out to watch the most of Laverne and Shirley and Lou Grant, too. All right, with, with the average household watching television six and a half hours a day, as we're told, do we need any more television, more money for television? I'm not sure that more television is what we're talking about here. We're talking about more diverse television. In some ways, the three networks aren't three corporations. They're one giant corporation with three divisions. Most of us can't tell the difference between an NBC and an ABC and a CBS program. 
but we sure can tell the difference in a PBS program. Well, what does public broadcasting do that the commercial networks do not do? Public affairs, particularly on things that are not hardcore politics, shows like World, which deal with the third world point of view, Nova, dealing with science, and which CBS is going to attempt to imitate later this year, uh, Culture, giving not merely a, a floor for the BBC and, and its productions, but for American cultural institutions, American theaters, American dance companies, American symphony orchestras, and they reach not only the people in their own areas, but people who live in parts of the country that don't have comparable institutions. Now, quickly, why doesn't commercial television do this for us? Because commercial television is not the entertainment business, it's not the news business, it's the advertising business, as anybody in it will tell you. The job is to get the audience there so you can rent their eyeballs to the advertisers. And, <laughs> and there is no interest in how much the program pleases the audience, how intensively they want it or like it. It's only how extensive an audience you can get, how big a crowd you can draw into the tent. Does public television need more funds? I think it clearly does. Why? Because at the moment, it's producing some drama, teeny bits of that, a fair amount of public affairs, and pretty good but limited cultural items. It has to buy from abroad. It has to do things on the cheap. And above all, it has no margin for error. It's not able to make mistakes. The three networks spend an average of $400,000 per pilot to make 140 pilots to come up with maybe 20 series for the fall. That's $56 million on losers. And there is no opportunity for public television to waste 10 cents. We're all human. We're not perfect. What would happen if all federal funds were taken away from public broadcasting, radio and television? It would disappear. Disappear. Corporations will pay for particular programs that they can put their names on. Individuals will send in when they see programs that they like. Nobody wants to send in money to maintain the satellite interconnect and all of those facilities of the 200 and some odd stations around the country that give every major community its own locally oriented public television. Mr. Henry, excuse me, what is the satellite interconnect? That, that's the system by which the, those 200 odd stations receive their programs. They, they don't use the telephone system as the commercial networks have done and are likely to continue doing for a little bit. In other words, bit. it ties the public broadcasting stations yeah. around the country together. Thank you. Mr. All these stations. Now, w would permitting commercial broad advertisements on public television end the need for federal funding, as proposed, uh, Mr. Dukakis said, by the Van Dierland Committee? No, it seems to me it's a relatively harmless proposal, but harmless mostly because it's so inconsequential. The Commercials would have to be grouped together. They couldn't be scattered throughout the programs. There couldn't be very many of them. They'd be only 3% of the day. And because public television attracts a lot of different people, but not too many at any one time, you couldn't charge very much for the commercials. Figure that the public television audience is a fifth of the network audience, and the number of commercials would be a tenth. Well, you're talking about 2% of the rate for a commercial on a commercial network. That's not very much money. Gentlemen, let me Mr. interrupt Rusher. this point. Mr. Rusher, you have some questions, I'm sure, for Mr. Henry. Mr. Henry, you say that 60% of television households watch public television at least once a month. That's the cumulative figure, according to the latest What study, would the figure yes. be if you excluded Sesame Street? It would be somewhat smaller, but How it small? seems to... How much smaller? It's not absolutely clear, but probably 35 to 40 percent. And the 40%. people who watch only Sesame Street include a very large percentage of those who are in low-income households, low-education households. And it's shows like Sesame Street that give the next generation a chance to break out of that in syndrome. In point of fact, if Sesame Street isn't included in the figures, not only would uh, 35 to 40 percent of public television's uh, uh, once-a-month attention of the public disappear, I can give you figures, we'll hear some testimony later, be near 50 percent, but also most of its claim to have much viewership in the black and, and, and uh, blue collar segments of the society, because that's where it is in the Sesame Street uh, category. Is that right? At this point, yes. Would, would you, you agree with, with more government money, there will certainly be more and similar programming for children. Would you agree? Right now, corporations want to program only to children when they can advertise cereals and toys to them. Would you agree with the statement that in practice... And public, public television won't take cereal and toy money. <laughs> Are you through? Yes, Mr. Rusher. I studied your technique, and I'm doing my best to follow it. <laughs> Thank you.
Mr. Russia. Uh, would, um, would you agree with the statement that, in practice, public television seeks public money without accountability? No, I don't think so. I Why did you make it, then? I've been studying you. <laughs> I'm quoting you, Mr. Henry. No, I think, One of your are, colleagues. I think there are individuals in public television. Now, that's not what it said. What it says is the vision sounds elitist, and in practice, it, meaning public television, seeks public money without accountability. This is one of your own columns. I, I think that is a, an incorrect excerpt of what I've said. Well, then I'll give you the entire column. Suppose you tell us what is correct about it. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Do you want to ask me a question while I look Certainly. at Certainly. I ask you whether or not you agree that in practice public television seeks public money without accountability, which is what you said in your own column. You don't agree with that. No, I, I don't agree with that. All I right. do you think there are individuals in public television who think that they should be secluded foundations. I don't. I'm sure I you... think public television, as part of getting more money, should have a mandate to donate a or devote a specific amount of its airtime to the elderly, to children, <laughs> to ethnic minorities. I think we're entitled, in exchange for public money, to get particular commitments to wish, the public. Uh, do you wish you had agreed at that time with what you're saying now? I don't think that there is a distinction. You don't see a distinction between individuals seeking uh, money, public money without accountability and an entire public television, do you? No, I don't. All right. Perhaps you don't. I think some of us mm -hmm. do. Tell me, what public affairs program of a, uh, a political type on public broadcasting uh, would you say it can point to with pride? I certainly enjoyed the, the Real America, the Ben Wattenberg show. I disagreed with a great deal of it, but I thought that he had a, a good deal to say that doesn't otherwise get said not only in public television, about, but in commercial how television. How about the one in which the narrator described Castro as a man who would not only change the course of Cuban history, but fire the imagination of the world? I think that's a fair estimation. Stalin and Mao Zedong did the same. And uh, you're a part of the world? Did he fire yours? He certainly made me, uh, shall we say, fantasize about missiles landing over my house. That's firing my imagination. Would it, <laughs> would it be fair to say that before asking more money, public broadcasting should do a better job with the money it has? You know, it has been said that its office on, was on the sweeping sixth floor of a building in the Mussolini monumental New L'Enfant Plaza in Washington. You know who said that, don't you? I'm not sure that I do. You did. <laughs> Another one of those. Uh, you should read your columns more often. I write eight of them a week. I can't always yes, appreciate when a clever phrase is my own. <laughs> Another I, clever I, phrase. I would like to particular. Could continue, I come back please? to your question? No, let me. What I said uh, was, no one but the yeah. system's own employees lobbies for quality television for an artistic vision that ignores ratings and special interests. Uh, let me read that you this. vision. Sounds yeah. elitist, and, and in practice it seeks public money without accountability. Seeks public money without that accountability. That is that some employees in the public television system want to do only Allow high me art. One more question. I don't believe in high art. Allow I believe me one in serving the people whom the commercial system that you endorse leaves unserved. Mr. Henry, I'll let's let Mr. Rusher ask one additional question. Please thank, do. thank you. Mr. This was Congress. one of his questions. Yes. Uh, Mr. Henry, uh, pursuing another one of your points in another column. President, do you believe that President Grossman of Public Broadcasting Service uh, deserves $100,000 as a salary for heading a service that is funded by the taxpayer? I, I wonder if the President of the United States deserves $200,000. I don't, but I, I also don't think that United States Senators and Congressmen and their staff people should be paid what they're paid. I think they should well, all have a salary closer the to the average wage. Where Mr. Grossman is it? Isn't that a distinction? They have, in other words, public the staff money with Congress, accountability, the staff of Congress exactly is not what I was talking about in the paper in your hand. Gentlemen, I'm sorry I have to interrupt. Let's go back to Mr. Fisher now for an additional question or two. Mr. Fisher. As a student of public broadcasting, do you believe that the 200 and odd television and the other radio, public radio stations are in fact responsive to public interest and perform ably in that role? Every single one of them is run by a local board made up of local people. The majority of them, in fact, are part of school systems. And school systems, as we all know, receive public funds and are entirely publicly accountable. I don't know that there's anybody more accountable than a school board. Thank you very much. Mr. Henry, thank you very much for being with us.
All right, let's turn to Mr. Rusher now, who has his first witness for us. Call my first witness, Mr. William Porville. Welcome to the Advocates, Mr. Porville. Porville nice is, as I said, the Vice Chairman of uh, Boston Broadcasting Incorporated and a lecturer at uh, Harvard Business School. Mr. Porville, why shouldn't public broadcasting get the quadrupled and more federal funding that it wants? Well, I think PBS is doing a very good job of serving a very small segment of the overall audience. How small a segment? Oh, it runs 2 to 5 percent, normally closer to 2 percent. Uh, they, I'm not sure that a substantial amount of funding would be, is necessary to serve that audience. And as a matter of fact, I think if they get this substantial amount of money, it would force a basic restructuring of the whole public broadcasting system, and I don't think that's a very good idea. Would it change the programming? I think it probably would in many ways. But what about commercial broadcasting in which you're involved? The accusation is that it zeroes in on mass markets and does, uh, doesn't do much with quality shows. Oh, there are many commercial broadcasters who do do local programming. We do programming in the health area and the religious area and arts areas. As a matter of fact, they get very good audiences. We did something last week. This was America, which used still photographs to show a segment of American history. And this show not only won its time period over other network shows, but I think it got much higher rating than any show on PBS all year. What about nationally? Well, nationally, uh, a lot of the networks are beginning to do more. Roots, Eleanor and Franklin, 60 Minutes, Edward the King. There are programs that are being done at the national level and will be done increasingly so. I, what about the impact of new technology? Will that have any further effect? Oh, I think it's going to encourage all local broadcasters to do more programming. There's going to be more diverse outlets as we get pay cable, as we get video cassettes easier forms of transmission, the viewer is going to have more options, and the broadcaster to survive is going to have to develop more forms of programs. It'll be sim simply a matter of commercial survival to give variety. That's correct. And diversity. With more money, though, uh, in the case of public broadcasting, wouldn't it guarantee better programming, or would it? I think if you look at some of the more popular, more informative PBS programs already, you see Julia Child, Jim Crockett's Victory Garden, Thalassa Crusoe, the, This Old House, these aren't high-budget shows. I, so that high-budgeting is not necessary to public broadcasting quality, is that your point? That's correct. Not only that, but I think that if you, it, if you increase the budget, you may get less diversity. What you may end up doing is getting more blockbusters, more centralized control of the broadcasting. And what do you mean by a blockbuster, Mr. Poole? Oh, I'd say programs such as Scarlet Letter, where you're spending $3 million to produce one program. A technical question. Uh, we use this term public broadcasting. But who or what actually owns the top ten, say, so-called public TV stations? Well, major markets uh, are primarily owned by private nonprofit entities. Not by the public, and not by government, but by private nonprofit entities. In most of the major markets. So that uh, the term public broadcasting is, in that sense, something of a misnomer. Yes. It is private nonprofit broadcasting, although the employees uh, make salaries just like the commercial network employees, I presume. Is that correct? There's no stockholders. Yes. That's the point. Uh, tell me, lastly, in your opinion, can public television? If it has really good programs to offer, get non-governmental funding for those programs? Well, I think they've proven in the past that they have been able to get this funding. And in point of fact, uh, you expect they could continue to on a sufficient basis and a sufficient quantity in the future? I would hope so. I thank you. No further All right, questions. Mr. Porvo, let's turn to Mr. Fisher, who has some searching questions, I'm sure, for you. Mr. Fisher? Let's try and understand. Uh, you come first from a very nice uh, commercial station here in Boston. I want to congratulate Mr. Rushen on picking a man from a single station that has more public affairs than any other commercial station in the country. Am I right on uh, that? I think we are. Do you have more local one. origination programs than any other station in the country? Yes, we do. But that's fine. Now, 
and you're not very typical of commercial broadcasting, are you? If you're the single commercial station in the country that's the best, you're not very typical. I think you're getting into a semantics question. I think there are many broadcasters who are doing local programming, and I think there are many more that are beginning to realize how important it is. Now, let's talk about government money for public broadcasting. Uh, what uh, you, the commercial stations, have the, fr the frequency licensed to them exclusively by the government for free, don't they? As each commercial station has a free use to make money out of that channel. Is that right? There is some fee for it, but... What's the fee? How much do you pay for your license, more or less? Uh, Very little. Legal fees to get it, but beyond that, how much? It amounted to millions of dollars. I mean, how much would you sell it for now? Uh, a license. A hundred million would you sell it for? A concept I have not considered. No, you would not sell it for a <clears throat> hundred million. You have, when we give the private profit makers a chance to graze in public lands, we charge them for it. When you give them the chance to make money out of the airways, you get it for free. Now, you essentially, each commercial broadcaster has a free use on which they make a gross profit on $8 billion of, of revenue, more or less of $2 billion, something like that. And they, they pay several billion dollars to the government in taxes. The government makes a great deal of money and you, from the commercial <coughs> TV broadcasters, whereas PBS you end up with a higher <laughs> You end up with a higher profit on using this government channel. Uh, you would say 25 percent compared to supermarkets that on gross compare 1 or 2 percent on gross, something like that. All the top 500 corporations make 5 percent on gross, and you make 25 percent on gross, roughly. Now, and you wouldn't sell the channel that you have free. We, the public could charge you for that several million dollars a year. Public commercial broadcasting, you'd still take it and make money, wouldn't you, on it, on the commercial channel? Well, it would depend on what we would be doing then. We'd be running different kinds of stations, and I don't think we'd be performing right. the kind of local services that we do perform and do the kind of local You agree there are local services to be performed? That is correct. Such as health programs? Of public service programs, public affairs, things of that kind. Yes, I think broadcasters should be doing this kind of program. Should they be doing more than they are doing? Oh, that's always a definition of terms. I suppose we always should be trying to do more and better. Should most other stations be trying to do as much as your station is trying to do? Well, different markets have different sets of problems. And why, why don't they do more? I think they're perhaps being short-sighted. I think if they did more, I think that this would be something that they would find, as we did, that it not only draws an audience, but involves the community in their station and can be profitable as well. It's fair to say the reason they don't is because they want to make money, isn't it? No, I think that's... Isn't that why they don't do more? Because it's a profit organization. The board of directors of a commercial broadcaster is trying to make money. I would make an argument that if they did more local programming and they paid more attention, they perhaps would make even more money. All right, if, if you agree there are some needs of this kind, small audiences, a Chicano-speaking audiences, blacks, the elderly, people who don't buy much toothpaste uh, proportionately, don't buy the automobiles, uh, that need service programming, <coughs> somebody should meet that. Why shouldn't it be public television? Like that? Well, I think we all should be meeting it. As an, as an example, you talk about Spanish programming. In many communities, there are the large markets. There are UHF stations that are specifically broadcasting in Spanish. They can provide the kind of service to a Spanish community that PBS can't do, because obviously you can only have occasional programs in Spanish, in the same way that we as a commercial broadcaster have occasional programs that are also in Spanish. You believe there should be public stations of the kind we have here tonight to supplement the commercial stations? I think that the a diversity of program source is a good idea. Right. And do you think we could survive without any federal funding? Well, you'd probably be a different entity. I think that you'd perhaps be more locally minded than you would worrying about sort of a national network. It would be a different operation. Whether it would be better or worse, I'm not quite sure. You think that we could do better programs on less money, whereas you spend an average of, what, eight times per pro hour commercial broadcasting than public television? Oh, no, we don't the have your budgets for local programs. No, nationally. <laughs> nationally, commercial television. The advocates, for example, we can do 10 weeks on what one hour, average hour of prime time commercial broadcasting is costing. Brief response, Mr. Pulvo, and then Is I'm that right? I wish I had your budget for one of our programs, too. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Mr. Pulvo, thank you for being here. Call Mr. M. Stanton Evans.
Mr. Mr. Rusher, before you begin, let me just say a word to our viewing audience, because some of them may have joined us late. And for those of you who have, our question tonight is, should Congress substantially increase federal funding for public broadcasting? Advocate Roger Fisher has presented his first witness, William Henry III, who is a television critic and who has argued that public broadcasting is a good thing, that it provides diversity and special programming for many groups in our society that don't get the kind of programming that Mr. Henry suggests they should on commercial television. On the other hand, Mr. Rusher has presented his first witness, Mr. William Purvu, who is in commercial broadcasting. And uh, Mr. Purvu has argued that public broadcasting is a limited audience, that it doesn't need these vast sums of money, and that commercial television can provide the kind of diversity and uh, difference in variety which our viewing population needs. Uh, now let's go to Mr. Rusher, who has his second witness, Mr. Evans. It's Mr. Nice Mr. To have Stanton you Evans, who is my witness, is to be distinguished from and not confused with, at least Mr. Eli Evans, is that correct? who is going to be the second witness for the other side. Right, Mr. Mr. Evans, uh, this Mr. Evans is a nationally syndicated columnist and a commentator on CBS Radio's Spectrum. Mr. Evans, what's wrong with the basic idea of government funding for broadcasting? Well, I think that there are inherent uh, doctrinal and practical problems in having government-funded broadcasting that create a kind of insoluble dilemma, uh, a sort of impossible uh, situation that you can't escape from. Either on the one hand, you have a, an insulated, self-perpetuating set of ideologues that are doing as they will with taxpayers' money to pursue their own interests without public accountability. Or on the other hand, you have the political arm that extends the money, exercising control over the way in which the programming occurs. You've got to have one or the other of those situations. It seems to me that both are unacceptable. We have had both. Uh, under the existing public broadcast setup, we continue to have both to some degree. And I think both are not only uh, philosophically offensive, but in my opinion, are in violation of the First Amendment. Can you give me examples of uh, these? Well, in the first category, you yourself and your questioning, uh, Mr. Henry referred to an example, a program on uh, sports in Cuba, which on my uh, evaluation was virtually an hour-long commercial for communist Cuba which proves there are commercials on public television. <laughs> and uh, another one in that same series about North Korea, which was virtually the same. I found both of those programs offensive. I bitterly resent having my tax money used to disseminate that kind of programming uh, against my will uh, to the viewing public. On the other hand, you have the difficulty that occurs when political people step in to try to correct the situation. The Carnegie Commission talks about this. Many other people have talked about it the effort of the Nixon administration to restore what it thought was, quote, balance, unquote, to public broadcasting. And while I sympathize with the impulse that the Nixon regime felt because of the imbalance, I think there is a real danger in that kind of initiative of having political control of a, a, a journalistic and artistic entity. But what about the need, uh, so often talked about, for diversity in programming, some alternative to the alleged mass audience approach of the commercial network? Well, I think the answer to that problem is not more government in broadcasting, but less. The reason we have the kind of structure we have in commercial broadcasting today is because of the regulatory policies of the Federal Communications Commission, which uh, since 1966, it's, it's been loosening up in the last few years, imposed a powerful impediment to the development of cable. Cable was barred from the 100 largest markets from 1966 to 1972 to protect the existing network set up and the vested interests that are involved in that. So that what you need, I think, is to free up, diversify the broadcasting situation authentically by getting government out of the roadbed and letting people through pay cable pay for the broadcast that uh, they want to get. But now in the case of pay a cable and so on, what about people who cannot afford uh, pay cable television? Well, we had a rather glancing allusion to the demographics of public uh, broadcasting earlier. I would, uh, looking at those same figures, which I have done with some care, those figures show the, the commercial uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting's own statistics show that 72 percent of the viewers of public television have household incomes of $10,000 a year or more. Uh, there's no question, both on a common sense reading and on the statistical reading, that the tilt is toward higher income uh, audiences and public broadcasting, which means you have a regressive transaction here because you are taxing people who are relatively poor to 
provide entertainment and instruction to people who are relatively well-to-do. What about the statement we hear that the BBC is a good example of a way to truly independent and yet publicly funded television? Our time is short. BBC so, uh, is a very good example of the problem I'm talking about. In the 1930s, uh, uh, prior to the outbreak of World War II, Winston Churchill attempted to speak out against the policy of appeasement in Great Britain. He was prevented from getting access to the British public through BBC. That occurred also when he tried to speak on, on Indian policy on another occasion. And there are problems right now with BBC, with voices in the, the Parliament, the Labour Party speaking out to politicize BBC. And once again, this has happened in other countries such as France and Sweden. It's an inherent danger of government-funded broadcast. Mr. Russia, we'll be back to you for some additional questions. I'm sure most of our audience knows this, but the BBC, of course, is the British Broadcasting Corporation, Mr. Correct. Evans, which is government-owned and, and funded. That is correct. Mr. Fisher. Thank you. Mr. Evans, let's see where we disagree. I think we disagree on two questions. One is on the appropriateness of using taxpayer dollars for programs uh, like the advocates, like public tellers and whatever it might be. And then the question of whether we can insulate it from governmental control. That's, is that a fair statement of the differences in position? Well, I, I will provisionally say yes. All right. Now, as to, appro <laughs> as to appropriateness of using taxpayers' monies to support views with which taxpayers disagree, how do you feel about the public library buying books with your tax dollars with which you disagree? Well, the difference between a public library and, uh, and broadcasting uh, is uh, one of uh, how you balance. If you want balance in a public library, and I think you should have balance in a public library, don't you? Yes, but indeed. But you can balance it by simply adding books, so you have a full spectrum of available reading material. In broadcasting, you have a limited time frame where ordinarily to add one thing means taking something else off, and that is a judgmental uh, decision which has to be made by some political authority, and that's where the danger enters in, the politicizing of journalism and artistic enterprise through government funding, which necessarily involves the let's political the, decision. Let's keep the, you don't mind buying the books you disagree with as long as they're balanced, as long as there's something else by someone's judgment. A public library can't buy the 40,000 titles published every year. They must make selection, too. Right? There is a judgment. There is an right. inherent sure. problem in, in uh, libraries right. that you have to have some kind of monitoring to see that there is problem. And you wouldn't throw away the public library because that's difficult, would you? Well, I'm not saying to throw away uh, the public library. I'm you saying the same problem. In principle, the same problem does exist, right. but the solution is much simpler in the case of the library. How about state universities? How about Fannel Hall, from which... Uh, this program used to be broadcast, the same supported problem by exists. taxpayers' money. The same problem exists. I was, I was a newspaper editor in a state capital for 15 years. There was nothing but political fighting over what went on at that state university right. all the time. And we did not quit. We would not give up the public parks because who speaks in there. We would not give up public libraries, not give up public schools, not give but up But you're ignoring the, the intrinsic problem, which is wherever you have public funding, you have public control. Now, what, you're, what the public broadcasting people are advocating, what your side is advocating, is that we have, in essence, some way to evade this dilemma, that either public we can trustees. have... We're, we're su suggesting, essentially, the form that we now have, 280 public stations with e independent boards... Okay, but where is the accountability duty. in that? So where is your accountability? Trustees I'm a taxpayer. How do you justify to me what will be done by those trustees with my At the end of the year, at the end of three years, Congress can look and see how well the trustees have performed their duty. They don't come down and pick out each book out of the public library. They can change the board. Now. But there have to be guidelines by which they decide whether they've done their duty. How do you know they've done their duty? What criteria would you use to decide that the trustees have done their duty? I would say the trustees ought to do that communication. If it is, if it is unbalanced <laughs> to, to one political point of view, have they done their duty? Mr. Evans has asked a question. Mr. Fisher, I guess you're going to respond. And I was going to say <laughs> that the public duty we see is to do those things which people motivated solely by profit in commercial television to maximize their profits don't do. That's totally negative. What should they do? They should communicate public service, citizenship participation, programs like this should be available this and funded. This is a balanced program. I think what it's reasonably balanced. a program balanced. that is an hour-long commercial for Fidel Castro's sports program? The, is that doing their duty with my tax money, I believe tax that money? over the year, the, the world program on, on uh, Cuba, other points of view helps this United States understand better how people see things. Yes, I do. Now, the fact that you disagree with all sorts of people, Mr. Evans, I'm asking who would you have decide? No, what let's, I let's, disagree let's, with, let's, let's, I don't disagree with them just, having that opinion. I disagree with making me pay for it with my tax money. Why should right, I me, pay my tax money to put Fidel Castro's propaganda on American television? If his books are in the public library, if Karl Marx is in Widener Library, do you want Stop paying. But I'm also in the public library. I'm not on public television except in an adversary condition. On the contrary, you have more television time than you could possibly expect to get. 
the, the uh, you're on commercial television and public television. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. CBS uh, radio, radio. Excuse me, commercial radio. And, and it's sustaining. All right. Service. Now, <laughs> on <coughs> no commercials. No commercials. In terms of ways of protecting it, federal dollars, an average of seventy-five dollars per person in the United States, federal tax revenue goes to support education, primary, secondary, and higher education. <clears throat> do you think the federal government controls our educational system too much? As a matter of fact, I, I do. I thought so. Uh, uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> if you'll examine, where do you think all this busing comes from? That is coming right out of Washington, D.C. It's coming out of HEW and the leverage of the federal dollars that are used against the local the, school the, districts. There is tremendous federal control over our school system today with a small minority of federal funding. You're talking about something that's going to be heavily funded by the federal government. It will definitely the mean The funding of public broadcasting would be the equivalent of $2.50 per person compared to federal funding of education, which is $75 per person. But proportionally, we're going to have one more response the total budget, budget, the federal funding of public broadcasting will be much bigger than proportionally the federal funding is of the public schools. And they're all, controlling the public schools. All public schools. Gentlemen, schools. gentlemen, I'm sorry I have to interrupt at this point. We're going to go back to Mr. Rush for another Mr. question. Evans, Thank uh, you, Mr. Fisher. you mentioned that you don't like your tax money being used for a particular propaganda film, say, on public broadcasting, and I can understand that, but... Uh, is that any different from the argument we sometimes hear that, well, everybody's tax money is used for things we don't like, either for the Vietnam War, for welfare, or something like that? How do you justify a particular complaint in this case? Well, it's, it's very different because the different nature of the enterprise involved. If I don't like you know, what is being done with my tax money in other ways, and I must say there are many other ways that I don't like my tax money's utilization, I have political redress. I can lobby my congressman. I can take political action in some way to demand political impediments being placed in the way of this utilization of my money. If that same kind of uh, protest or activity occurs in the case of journalism or artistic expression, as it would in the case of public broadcasting, that puts us in the constitutional dilemma that I talked about before. We then run into the First Amendment, and you've got government interference with expression. Gentlemen, I'm sorry I have to interrupt. Mr. Evans, thank you for being with us. Now, Mr. Fisher has his own Mr. Reverend, as I understand it. Mr. Fisher, yes, thank your next you. witness. <clears throat> Our second witness has the unique distinction of having served with both uh, Carnegie Commissions, one in 67 and one in now. He is the president of the Reston Foundation, Eli Evans. But Eli, you take the seat. <clears throat> <clears throat> Welcome to the Advocates. Nice to have you with us. Excuse me. As a student, had an unusual chance to study public broadcasting. How's it doing? What's it been doing the last 10 years? Well, I think what we've seen in the last 10 years is the growth of an extraordinary force in American life, a force for education, a force for instruction, a force for enlightenment. Uh, it's quite an amazing story, really. Uh, to contrast with the, the BBC uh, story in England, the English uh, started a public system in 1920 and really didn't introduce a commercial system, a broadcasting system, into Britain until about 10 years ago. We did the opposite in this country. We turned our total broadcasting entity uh, over to uh, commercial uh, uh, interests, it became entrenched, it became pervasive. It's really been in the, only in the last 10 years that we've really built a, a viable, uh, effective public system in this country. Now, can public broadcasting function without federal money? I think it would be difficult, and we would see a, a very uh, a barren uh, kind of medium. Uh, what people don't understand is that, that broadcasting is an expensive business. Uh, we mentioned today that the uh, Scarlet Letter, for instance, cost uh, $500,000 an hour uh, to uh, produce. People complain about uh, British pro programming, but the reason there's so much British programming, one reason there's so much British programming on public broadcasting is that you can buy that programming for $20,000 an hour. Well, you contrast that with the $400,000 that it costs uh, uh, to make costume drama. You can see why it's so economical, really, to put more foreign broadcasting on public television than... Uh, uh, than we really have been able to produce uh, with American artists. And that's a tragedy, really, because there is such a rich resource in American artists in this country who, who really want to, uh, uh, who want to produce, who want to create. And we've got to be able to support them, and the only way to do it really is to get a sizable amount more money uh, going into public broadcasting. All right, let's deal with the question that the other Mr. Evans was, uh, we, he and I were discussing, which is how we can insulate, uh, can we receive federal funds without having federal censorship? Uh, can we get government money without having it radio Mo sound like Radio Moscow or whatever it be, Radio Washington? Uh, I think uh, this question, which was really uh, a question which plagued both Carnegie Commissions, 
uh, both in 67 and the one that just uh, made its report, has been one that will be with us uh, throughout uh, the history of having any kind of public enterprise in this, uh, in this country. It is always a struggle uh, to maintain the independence of private uh, institutions, uh, and incidentally, most public, broadcastings are, public broadcasting stations are, uh, privately, uh, uh, are, are privately run by lay boards. Uh, it is always a struggle to retain that, uh, that kind of freedom. The question then is, if it does take more money to produce quality broadcasting, $150,000 an hour for a major documentary, if it does take that kind of money to produce it, uh, how do you structure the receiving of that money in order to keep it free, in order to keep it flexible, in order to provide a home for creative artists to do their work? That's the struggle for public broadcasting. It is the same struggle that Harvard University has uh, receiving federal funds. It is the same struggle that the public uh, schools have in terms of the freedom of the teacher in the classroom. Uh, that artist, that programming is going to be a continuing uh, uh, struggle. And we have tried in the Carnegie Commission reports, both of them, to structure a system whereby uh, a unique American system whereby uh, uh, trustees uh, will, re will help protect uh, the system from uh, undue political interference. And it's your conviction it can be done, as it is in state universities, public libraries, and private universities? It's a struggle. It's a constant battle. The battles over academic freedom, the battles over government interference are a constant one, but it's one that can be done in this country and must be done uh, if we're to have uh, private institutions with some public support. And if we win that battle, what kind of television might we have on public broadcasting? Well, it's, a, it's, it's difficult because uh, uh, in the last 10 years, we've seen such an extraordinary, so, so many extraordinary flickers of, of real greatness. Uh, the Public Broadcasting Laboratory in 1969 was the precursor of the magazine of the air, 60 Minutes, first Tuesday that the commercial system adopted. Sesame Street uh, was the first program really that lifted the vision of parents to see just what television could really achieve. That's an extraordinary American achievement. Uh, we, uh, we, by bringing uh, the miniseries from Britain in, we introduced to commercial broadcasting the very idea of a series of just five programs, the, the novel for television, which has been emulated in commercial broadcasting. In that sense, I think I see public broadcasting, and the Commission did too, as a pioneer, as an innovator that can show the rest of the broadcasting system what can be done, and that that public interest and innovation will continue to change over time as public broadcasting continues to be an experimenter uh, to, uh, to bring new kinds of broadcasting into, into the home. Mr. Evans, let's turn to Mr. Russia now, who has some good searching questions for you. Uh, Russia? A couple of primitive ones first. So simple, I think they're almost primitive. Who decides, who shall decide, what the public needs in television? Well, I think the answer to that is that uh, all we can do is, is hold out a vision of a kind of, uh, of education, of the marketplace of ideas, of the importance of public citizenship, uh, of, uh, of knowledge about public affairs and public events, of the importance of, uh, uh, of culture generally, not to just to the rich but to everyone, and hope that we can, we can, we can sort of bring into the American home that kind of, of uh, a vision. That's, that's a lovely vision, Mr. Evans, but answer the question. Who shall decide what the public gets in television? Uh, I don't... I don't understand the, the, the thrust of the question, really. Are you, are well, you asking whether... there is going to be in, this, in the United States, presumably television, uh, its uh, nature is going to be determined by someone, what it programs. Who decides? Well, the broadcasters who run these stations have to decide what kind of programming their local community needs. And when, when, oh, when, they, they decide what it needs. The, the, the local community, which is licensed to that local community in this country, with its lay membership on its board and the professional broadcasters who run that station don't decide what it needs. They decide with a kind of uh, understanding of their communities, the kind of broadcasting that they believe their, their community needs. And some kind of osmotic process is going on in which the public uh, desire, assuming there is a public desire, and I think... Russia, could you translate that word for gets, those of us? Uh, <laughs> oozing through, I, uh, I would say, would do it. Some kind of process by which the broadcasters figure out well, what the, broadcasters, the public needs or what the public wants? No, Wait. the broadcasters really do try through what they call ascertainment, which means a kind of polling mechanism with the viewers in their area, what it is the public wants. Wants or needs? What it is the public wants, wants. And, and often that question is determined by what the public is seeing. Uh, I don't know that uh, if, you, if you took a person who had never really seen television at all and asked him what, uh, what he wanted to see, whether uh, uh, 
uh, there would be uh, necessarily a, a demand for. If I, I, I hate to leave the uh, witness, particularly one from the other side, but is it possible that we could say that the public would have something to say yes. about what the public needs? Yes. And Viewers in a say. democracy, what is the normal way of ascertaining the public will? Well, uh, I don't know where you're leading me with this. I know you don't. <laughs> uh, oh, people I'm vote. Is people this. vote. As Mr. Evans said, there's a dilemma involved. I think it's a very real dilemma. You said it's a constant struggle. Yeah. That was your phrase for it. Either we are going to have, in a democratic society, a, a, a political determination of, of the content of our programming in one way or another, or we have some form of group determination, which is in necessarily more elitist than a broad public determination. I don't this is the dilemma, and I, I don't much care where you turn out on it. I just want to find out which. No, uh, I recognize the dilemma, you can make and, it go I, away. and I think I think uh, that it is going to be an ongoing dilemma for any system that is funded by public funds. I another imagine. another primitive question. Uh, you say funded by public funds. Where do these public funds come from? They're tax dollars. Tax dollars voted by and the they Congress. come from where? Well, let me just uh, sort of spell that out a little bit. You know, this system is not funded by totally by federal funds. Don't take too long at it. I'm asking about the federal funds, where they come I know, come but from. only a third of those of that right. money comes from federal sources. The rest come from private dollars contributed by individuals, corporations, and foundations, as proposal, well as as well as well from state governments and Your proposal, and local uh, Mr. Evans, is for $590 million, over half a billion dollars a year, to be provided by the federal government from tax monies taken from, let's say it. But triggered, Shall we? But triggered Can by... Can we get the word out yes. from the people of the United States, yes. right? All of them. Yes. Whether they watch television or your kind or mine or not. That's all I want to do. Yes, but that money is to be triggered, Mr. Rusher, according to the <laughs> Carnegie proposals, by the amount of money that is raised in the local Community. Before it is triggered, wouldn't it be a good idea for the public broadcasting system to do a better job with the money it has? Your fast-writing colleague, Mr. Henry, in one of his eight-a-week columns, wrote that the General Accounting Office had found waste, mismanagement, and slipshod banking, uh, bookkeeping practices in uh, public <coughs> broadcasting. Should something be done about that before we pour another $590 million down the same hole? <laughs> yes, I think so. You think so? Yes, so do I. I don't defend mismanagement on the part of the I don't case. think you would. I take it there will be less, uh, there will be less British programming uh, on the public broadcasting system, as you see, no more upstairs, downstairs. Huh? Well, hopefully, if we can have original American drama, we can sell some of those programs to the British and, and get and some money Joe, back Joe from Pap it. Joe Papp will do the Shakespeare hereafter. Not necessarily. Well, maybe, not necessarily maybe, Joe. No, maybe it'll be the uh, School of the Arts down in North Carolina, where I come from. Did the Carnegie uh, Commission uh, in, uh, One last question, Mr. Rusher, did please. Did the Carnegie Commission uh, believe, I take it it did not, that, uh, that the Corporation for Public Broadcasting had successfully resisted Mr. Nixon's inroads? Uh, as a matter of fact, on page 49 of your report, you say, we observed that the board took action to downplay public affairs programming in order to avoid placing the entire federal appropriation in jeopardy. And we just heard from Mr. Fisher that it is essentially the same formula that he proposes to use for the future. A brief response, exactly. please, Mr. Evans. Well, I think the, the Nixon incidents and the, and the efforts of the Nixon administration, not just to get public, broadcast, public affairs broadcasting off the air, but to manipulate and exploit the medium in their own behalf is one of the tragic stories of this decade. Again. It is one of the tragic stories of this decade. And will it happen again? It will not happen if there are diversified sources of funding, which I think if is a very centerpiece. essentially the same formula that Mr. Fisher the said center, The centerpiece of the Carnegie proposals, which is a mixed formula of funding from, from many different sources. Gentlemen, there is I'm political sorry, opinion. gentlemen, I'm sorry I have to interrupt. There's strength in that diversity. Thank you for being with us. Appreciate it. All right. Let's go to our closing arguments. Mr. Fisher, you have one minute. We in this country have more to offer each other than police shows and professional football. In our entire history, no tax dollars have been spent more wisely than those we spend on public libraries, public schools, public museums, state universities, town halls, and the village green. Like these institutions, broadcasting inspires us, sometimes bores us, brings us together, lets us hear the best that each can offer each other. It helps us govern ourselves as best we can. Ten years ago, with such purposes in mind, some of us who are here tonight started The Advocates. During those ten years, it was off the air for three years because of lack of funds. Today, even though The Advocates is produced at a ten weeks program for the cost of one on commercial television in prime time, we still desperately need money, federal money. All we're talking about is $2.50 per person in this country for a year public broadcasting across the country. 
Certainly it's worth that just to hear Bill Rusher alone. <coughs> now, if you agree with me, write us and say, yes, more federal money for public to broadcasting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Rusher, you have one minute also. If you don't think it's worth it to hear me, vote no. <laughs> Public broadcasting has served a very useful purpose in this country. In these early years when commercial television has been limited to a relatively few channels and public taste was just developing. But we have learned tonight that we are on the threshold of a brand new era in which technology will be able to provide each of us through cassettes, cable TV, pay TV, and much else with any kind of television we want at a price legitimately related to its cost. We have learned, moreover, that public broadcasting, as we know it today, isn't even all that public, that large chunks of it are comfortably in private hands, earning its executives very nice salaries without the inconvenience of having to make any payments, whatever, to stockholders. This is the enterprise that now comes to you and demands four and a half times the taxpayer support it has hitherto had, more than half a billion dollars a year, to aggrandize and perpetuate itself into a future that will not need it. Ladies and gentlemen, stand up not for your privileges and pleasures, but for your principles. Vote no. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And now we turn to you in our audience. You're all viewers of public television this evening. You're also taxpayers. And we ask you to tell us how you feel. What do you think? Should Congress substantially increase federal funding for public broadcasting? Send us your yes or no vote on a postcard with your comments to the Advocates, Box 1979, Boston 02134. On March 11th, the Advocates debated the question, should Congress deregulate trucking? Our audience responded this way, 4%, 4% said yes and 96% said no. <laughs> on the other hand, it appears from our mail that there was an organized writing campaign which has something to do with that 96% which said no. <laughs> And now we hope you'll join us next week for another important and exciting debate. Our thanks to Mr. Fisher and Mr. Rusher, their distinguished witnesses, and to our hosts, the Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard University. Thank you very much, and good night. If you would like a written copy of tonight's debate, send $2 to Transcript, Post Office Box 1979, Boston 02134. This program was produced by WGBH-TV, which is solely responsible for its content and was made possible by grants from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner & Smith, Incorporated. The Advocates is produced with the cooperation of the Institute of Politics of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Thank mm -hmm. you.